Okay, it's time for questions and answers. And thank you to all of our presenters. Um, we have a few questions here. Um, the first one, is anyone piggybacking the studies to see if animal health also improves as we improve the human measures? Renee, that's probably a good one for you. Yeah, um, perfect question. Um, in the study that um, Matt and I have been looking at, one of the outcomes um, in, in looking at an intervention at a building that has multiple farrowing rooms, um, workers go from room to room to room. So one of the, the best ways of tracking uh, success uh, reducing contaminants is to see do we get better outcomes with the animals. So that's definitely um, something that um, is important to know because it's also a way to get more people to see the benefit of improving the air quality. If it helps them with production, um, that is a, a win for everyone. So that's definitely something we're looking at. Great, thanks. Um, Matt, I know you answered a couple of these, but I'm going to ask them again so the whole audience can catch them. With the bio, bio, bio aerosol sampling, do you have comparable um, data from natural environments? Yeah. Um, well, I think the, you know, it kind of like depends, right? The classic answer, but the, <clears throat> so using the whole genome sequencing approach you know there's data available from a lot of different sources you know atmospheric sampling soil sampling gut microbiome lung, lung microbiome there are a lot of data available you know one of the challenges is that the level of specificity of the data is variable and also what the data are is variable so like the you know the organisms that are identified and and really these whole genome sequencing tools have really expanded um, microbiology in a way that um, uh, is really unprecedented. Um, so we're learning about organisms uh, that are, or at least the DNA from organisms that are present that we just know nothing about. And so the, you know, the question is, well, you know, what, what's bad, what's good, what's normal, what's, you know, those, those it raises really more questions than it answers. But uh, from a control standpoint, I mean, I think it, um, it gives us an idea as to like, well, you know, what's kind of the distribution of the types of organisms that are present in this dust. And then, you know, if we're going to design a system to say, try and reduce um, specific pathogens, you know, like, you know, staph or, or uh, streptococcus or specific viruses, what sort of dosing do we need um, on those systems to inactivate those organisms? So, so yeah, it's, it's not a perfect tool. Um, uh, and there are some data that are that we can look at, but um, you know it's it's pretty challenging to compare compare you know even across like uh, you know gut microbiomes among people you know it's it's a constantly changing environment and so it, um, it's it's challenging but yeah there are some data very good thanks and then one other one so on the transmission from animal to human do we also see much transmission from humans to animals the reverse direction right so that I mean that that's the uh, kind of a, a, an unknown um, you know the there is evidence of transmission from humans to animals and we see that like with TB um, you know there's been several documented cases of that and so, so um, you know it I think it's a real concern and on from the influenza side side it's a little bit uh, tougher. Um, it's possible to evaluate that um, through like, you know, I kind of keep mentioning these sequencing tools, but, you know, we can use those to track, um, you know, uh, uh, specific viruses and, and that sort of thing, uh, like you know, subtypes of viruses, strains. Um, so it's, it's possible, um, but typically it hasn't been a big focus. And, um, you know, it, you know, in, especially with flu, you know, where we have a vaccine available, you know, a seasonal vaccine, water valent vaccine, um, you know, so that it's been less of a focus, but I think, you know, with managing and, and dealing with the impact of the current pandemic, I think it's going to have more, more of a focus um, in the future. It's just my opinion. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, so there's a question on that we don't see a lot 
about or hear much about human pathogens as we're applying like liquid manure and spraying that on the fields or likewise um, pathogens being blown out with the dust from the livestock production buildings. Any thought as to why we don't hear much about that and is it really an issue or is it not a huge source of transmission? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, I mean, I don't see it, um, you know, given the geographic isolation of a lot of, you know, the farms. I mean, I think, you know, the, um, you know, it's, it's tough to say something specifically came from a, you know, farm or a location. And, you know, I mean, given the geographic distribution, we're much more likely to see transmission from animal to animal of, you know, like uh, production, uh, you know, like swine pathogens and that sort of thing. And I think there's pretty clear evidence of that. Um, but from um, transmission off the farm, that's, that's a tougher one. Um, but it is possible to link those and often they're linked with, you know, foodborne outbreaks, um, you know, like contaminated water or, or, or that, that sort of thing. And, you know, we just absolutely hope that that doesn't happen. And I think producers are pretty good about thinking about this now um, um, and thinking about distancing and, you know, not having buildings so close to one another and changing how people come into the farm, how they go, uh, how they enter the buildings, uh, the processes that they follow for, uh, you know, preventing movement of microorganisms. I mean, farms have improved immensely over the last, you know, 10 years from that. Um, so, so we're making really good strides um, in that area, but it's, there's still challenges. Renee, did you have anything to add? Yeah, there, um, it, it doesn't happen so much with land application um, in um, very um, agricultural areas, but uh, the issue of uh, pathogens when you're applying it to things like golf courses, right, where there's a lot more human interaction, there's a lot of work um, that is done in that field. So the technology is, is there. It's just we haven't been looking at it because we don't have as much people interacting with land applied lands uh, in agricultural communities like we do in, in other situations. Okay. And then we also um, had a question or comment on that we don't, um, that it works really well when we have livestock and produce operations closer together for, you know, sharing those nutrients. Um, but it, do we need to be worried about the transmission of foodborne pathogens if we have that? I mean, I, me doing what I do, I could see how that could potentially contaminate, um, you know, lettuce. Um, and so the, uh, I think, you know, um, folks are, um, you know, so geographical, geographical distance, you know, between those sites is probably important, but, um, you know, I don't know for sure. And I think looking at the epidemiology of, you know, food, foodborne illness and where, um, what the sources are um, is probably, you know, the best way to determine if that's a real problem. Um, that's my, that's my opinion. Um, but I could see how, you know, mechanistically, how, you know, stuff is exhausted out of a building, how it could potentially contaminate um, lettuce that was, would be right next door. Yeah, I believe like, when we look at good agriculture practices, there are things, especially those that are producing, you know, uh, a vegetable crops such as lettuce, good agricultural practices want to make, they have a couple of different checklists. One of those is to make sure that you've, you've not put raw manure or, or things on the fields that there's different check, like are like animal feces being used? Or uh, is there, is there barriers to prevent like wild animals from defecating or moving around? Uh, making sure that produce like fruits not picked up off the ground and used uh, different things. But I'm not an expert on, on good agriculture practices, but working with some folks in food safety, um, we've seen, you know, there was an issue with some uh, cantaloupes, I believe in Colorado. Um, and we had a, a dairy and a tractor being used on both fields, I believe, but I can't remember that study, but that one uh, was an outbreak of listeria, I believe. But yeah, there is issues with, transferring between equipment and uh, so good agriculture practices are, are, are set up to to limit that transmission. 
Okay, great. Um, Michael, I think this is one for you. Um, do, are the use of respirators mandatory or voluntary? Does OSHA have requirements on any of that? <clears throat> that that all depends. Depends on um, the uh, type of operation that you have, as far as number of employees. If you have ten or fewer, you are ex <coughs> excuse me exempt from OSHA enforcement. Uh, but there can be enforcement of like general uh, duty clause where you know you you are aware of a particular hazard, and you know, some people can uh, become um, injured or or ill from that practice. Um, and if you do require as a part of your, uh, program, if you are, are a uh, operation where they, you know, you mandatory, you say, Hey, these, uh, individuals who do these types of work must wear a respirator. There is a respiratory protection program that must be established by the operation. Uh, and there are very good outlines of what those include. Uh, and if anybody's interested, we can, uh, shoot you links to those, um, so requirement depends uh, whether or not enforcement occurs on uh, OSHA exempt or OSHA non-exempt uh, operations, depending on the number of employees. And let me throw in that there also is the uh, issue of a, a temporary labor camp, uh, whether or not you provide housing and require that housing uh, for workers on, on site. So it all depends. And, and if you've got more questions, I'd be glad to chat with you all online on that if you've got, you want to work through that. So 